The Lakers' offensive reawakening doesn't last long. John ja Morant continues to make his all-star case, and Kyrie Irving takes a big step toward his return to the Nets. It's all coming up on a Thursday edition of Locked On NBA. <laughs> Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, we got a great show for you today. I'm Wes Goldberg here with Big Dave. However, you may be listening on YouTube, Odyssey, or wherever you get podcasts. Thank you for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Big Dave, how's it going? I am beautiful. I have a question for you. And I'm asking you, and I'm sure I'm going to be upset at the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. What's (laughs) the weather where you are right now? Oh, it is a crisp, I think, 78 degrees, which is, uh, I think, the lowest it's been all day. <laughs> uh, you're right. I, I knew what I was going to do. I knew what was going to happen. I knew how upset I was going to be. I asked it anyway. Th- thank you for your honesty. <laughs> it's better. It's a lot warmer than it is in Chicago, I'm sure. Um, a little bit. Big Dave joining bit. us, the co-host of Locked on Bulls. Um, thanks for jumping on here on a Wednesday night slash Thursday morning. We've got a lot of games to get into, so let's just jump right in. And um, it's time to talk Lakers, who lost to the Grizzlies 104 to 99 after leading by as many as 14 points in the third quarter. But the Grizzlies tied the game at 83 with 10 minutes left and outscored the Lakers by 10 in that fourth period. John Morant led the Memphis Grizzlies comeback by scoring 11 of his 41 points in the final seven and a half minutes and helped the Grizzlies. Uh, get a seven-point lead with four and a half minutes to go. Meanwhile, the Lakers' offense just went zero dark 30 down the stretch. They settled for jumpers, turned the ball over a bunch of times, five times to be exact, missed easy shots. Russell Westbrook with two minutes left, for instance, missing a layup at the basket that could have cut the deficit to one. Still, the Lakers had a chance late. Down three with 16 seconds remaining. Malik Monk sets a screen for LeBron James, who passes it back to Monk. Monk fumbles the ball, misses a wide-open Russell Westbrook in the corner, tosses it instead back to LeBron. LeBron loses his footing. He throws the ball away, and the Lakers never even get off that potential game-tying shot. Dave, what happened on that last play? Man, you know, I want to... I wanted to credit the Memphis defense so bad because their defense has just been stellar all season. It's kind of what's carried them, especially when John Morant was out. Their defense definitely carried them. And it was a great defensive stand. If you watch it, you know, everybody knew where to be. The switching was perfect. John Morant, when he switched off of Malik Monk and got into the passing lane where uh, Russell Westbrook was, it was perfect how everybody switched off. But I think the biggest thing I took away from that was Malik Monk not passing to the wide open Russell Westbrook. And that was purposeful because he knew that it's Russell Westbrook in the corner. He's like, you can't shoot. I don't trust you to hit this shot. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get it back to LeBron James, who I trust through my whole life right here to hit these shots, who had also set a career high in three pointers and he hit eight threes. So he was just out there out of control balling. So I understand why, but still, that said a lot about how they feel about Russell Westbrook. Even though that was the right play to make, yeah, I understand. I understand. It would have been a tough pass to get the ball to Russell Westbrook. Westbrook was wide open, but the way that John Morant closed out on Monk, he kind of t- closed out that passing lane. That's not to say it would have been impossible because Monk kind of dribbled the ball a couple times, sort of f- kind of fumbled it. There was an opportunity for him to get the ball to Russ. But uh, I do think that just when you're a young player like Malink Monk is and you're in doubt, you just sort of go back to your comfort zone and pass it back to LeBron. Now, I'll say this. The fact that they went to a pick and roll between Malik Monk and LeBron James at the end of a game when they needed a shot, when they needed a three, says a lot about where this Lakers offense is. Like, that's Mm -hmm. your staple play. That's your go-to crunch time offense is a screen with Malik Monk, not a screen with Russell Westbrook. The guy You just plant him in the corner instead. I'm not saying it's the wrong play. It's the right play. Uh, Russell Westbrook has actually been pretty decent shooting threes out of the corner this season. I I just think it says a lot. LeBron also... He tends to gravitate towards guys throughout the course of a season. And this is a new look Lakers roster. And you can kind of tell, all right, which guys is he trusting, specifically at the end of games? He's starting to log a lot of minutes with Malik Monk. I know that they have injuries and protocols and all these things. But um, I do wonder if some of that trust starts to evaporate when when Monk didn't. I don't know if I, you, you say he makes the right play. I kind of think that he... That, 
that LeBron expected him to shoot that ball. I know that mm. Memphis closed out hard and stuff like that, but I think he expected, hey, I'm LeBron James. I'm getting you an, an open shot here. There, mm -hmm. It, it would have been a tough shot, but after that initial pump fake, if he, instead of trying to attack the lane, maybe just sidestepped into a three, that might have been there. I don't know. There's a lot of shoulda, woulda, coulda stuff, right. but I'm just saying LeBron tends to trust guys to take that shot, and Malik Monk never even took a shot. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that because he, you can even look at the way LeBron passed the ball, the way he yeah. passed it, you know what I'm saying, with a little flair he put on that. He expected oh, yeah. him to shoot that basketball. You're right. You're absolutely right on that. But Malik Monk, I'm sure in his head, is like, but you hit eight threes. <laughs> you know, you're LeBron James. Why aren't you shooting this basketball? And I understand that. I understand that philosophy and that mindset right there. Because, again, he wasn't passing to Russell. Russell was not the guy he was going to look for. He's going to look for the dude that was hot, that even got them in that situation to even be in the game, to even have a chance to get back to that win. But that is also LeBron's MO, right? That's kind of what he's been his whole career. When it's down to that last second, he makes the right play, whether it's him taking the shot, whether it's him trying to get it to the open man in the corner. No matter if he hit 45 threes, he will pass that ball to somebody if they're open for that. But in this instance, I understand why Malik Monk wanted to give it back to him. Yeah, like I said, I, I, I it, there was a lot of things happening there. Give credit to Memphis. You got to give it where it's due. Talking about LeBron, over the last six games, he's been on an absolute tear. Here are yeah. point total. 31 points, 34 points, 36 points, 39 points, 32 points, 37 of points. He's getting mm -hmm. close to double-doubles, if not double-doubles in each of those games. Meanwhile, the Lakers are 1-5 in five in those games. LeBron's doing everything he can, and yet, despite all of that, in this game, I thought the turning point was right in the middle of that fourth quarter. It wasn't I know a lot of people are going to focus at the end there, but there were two minutes in that, or, or sorry, three minutes in the middle of the fourth quarter, from seven and a half minutes to four and a half minutes mm -hmm. uh, in that period. This was the Lakers' offense. Here's just a play by play of how it went. Carmelo turnover. LeBron misses a 34 footer that he took that that he takes way early in the shot clock. Then he misses a pull-up jumper that probably wasn't the best shot that they, the Lakers could have got. Westbrook misses a layup. Westbrook turns the ball over with a bad pass. Taylor Horton Tucker misses some turnaround fadeaway jumper that he really didn't have any business taking. LeBron turns it over, uh, trying to get it to Stanley Johnson in the paint. And then that's the Lakers' offense for three minutes. No, they don't score. And while that's happening, John Moran is out here scoring eight points in less than three minutes. He scores, like I said, 11 of his 41 in the final seven and a half minutes of that game. The Lakers go from up one to down seven, 99 to 92, with four and a half minutes to go. That, to me, was the ball game. Not really what happened at the end, but giving up that 14-point lead and then going down by seven mm -hmm. because your offense just can't not even make a basket, but even get a decent shot off. That, to me, is when they lost the game. Yeah, that's a good point. And also, I want to give credit to Desmond Bain as well. Because he also kind of kept them in the game in that third quarter when the Lakers were trying to make that run and just run away from them. He wouldn't allow it. And he's been a perfect sidekick to uh, John Morant and a perfect guy to step in when John Morant hasn't been there. So he played great. He did wonderful. Lakers also had 18 turnovers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that's also not going to win you a game. And it feels like every game, Russell Westbrook misses a key layup or mm -hmm. a key dunk in the fourth quarter when they need to have it. I remember he, he did it against the Bulls. I remember that. He missed a dunk. Like, he just absolutely missed it. And it's weird because, again, he had a triple-double. He had, what, 16, 10, and 12. Like, he had a triple-double again. But, man, it's hard for me to say that, you know, LeBron's doing everything. I, I get it because he is, but I don't like when people say, like, he oh, he just needs more help. He needs more help. Like, they, they got five Hall of Famers on the team. Like, I don't know if he needs more help. If he needs different help. I can hear that. But yeah. I don't know about more help. You know what I'm saying? They've got enough horses to get out there and win a basketball game. It just not. It, it just hasn't clicked yet. Well, that's. I'm, I'm kind of with you. That's why I bring up that three minute stretch. It wasn't because it's not a lack of talent that this team has. I mean, talent, whatever it is. I know that these guys are older. You talk about five Hall of Famers. A lot of them aren't playing like Hall of Famers right now. Yeah. But they should know how to get a decent shot on offense. They've been in the league long <laughs> enough, and it just yes. feels like so often they're just so. Just, I don't know, not interested in trying to get a good shot. And yeah, LeBron made eight three pointers, but there's a lot of games where he's just settling for threes. There's a lot of not, he's, he's making them these last six games as, you know, made obvious by those point totals. But I don't know. It just, you watch these Lakers games and especially late in these games, it's like, do you even care about trying to get a good shot or are you just sort of just going to be lazy and just settle for jumpers every single time down and just say, you know what? 
Hopefully we make them tonight. And if we don't, no big deal. I don't know. Uh, you mentioned John Morant. Let's talk John Morant. Uh, he's obviously having a career season, but it's starting to force a conversation about where he ranks among the league's top point guards. Do you think that Morant belongs in that conversation? Oh, absolutely. He belongs in that conversation. You know, I laugh now when I think about when he came back from the injury and fans were like, oh, I think we should trade him. <laughs> I think we should let go of this guy. Because remember, Memphis was winning. They were playing yeah. very well uh, and winning games. And I'm like, why is that a detriment to John ja Morant? Because his team is good. I don't understand how that works. But Ja came back and he got reacclimated. This is his second 40 and 10 performance against the Lakers. His second one. All right. Like the dude is special, like with a capital S. And he plays with a chip on his shoulder that is kind of like a Russell Westbrook, but it's a little bit more controlled and it looks a little bit more smoother. You know what I'm saying? I think he definitely belongs in those conversations because he's the best player on the team. Like not only is he going to be in those conversations, he's going to be in conversations when they start talking about handing out hardware at the end of the year. I'm not saying he's going to win or even going to be top five, top 10 or anything like that. But he's going to be in those conversations just because of where I think Memphis will be. And a lot of that will be because of his play and what he does. So, yeah, that's right. one of those conversations about best point guards in the league. Yeah, he's in it for sure. The Grizzlies are 12-12 and 12 with John Morant this season. They are way better without John Morant this mm -hmm. season. I don't care about that stuff. I'm with you, Big Dave. I don't care. They're, they've won their last three games. John Morant is back. He's playing awesome. Whatever the Grizzlies figured out in John Morant's absence, they can keep doing that. But now they have John Morant back, somebody who can lead that offense. They were always going to need Morant back. That was yeah. always going to be the case. They have him back. As far as whether or not he can make an all-star team, because there's a conversation to be had about that. In the Western Conference, you've got Steph, Chris Paul, Donovan Mitchell. Those are your no-brainers in the backcourt, right? But John Morant's right there with Luka Doncic, yeah. Damian Lillard. Uh, he's probably not I, I would probably give Devin Booker the edge at this point right now also in the backcourt but mm -hmm. then there's other guys you know you have Shea Gilgis Alexander in Oklahoma City Anthony Edwards from the Timberwolves DeJounte Murray from San Antonio like I would put John Morant over those like last three guys that I mentioned but mm -hmm. I think he's right there in that Luka Doncic Damian Lillard conversation which is not a bad place to be just your third <laughs> year into the NBA <laughs> um all right Jalen Brown shows the flaw that could keep him from becoming the player. The Celtics mm -hmm. need him to be. That's coming up next. But first, let's talk about our friends at Truebill. From forgotten free trials to automatic renewals, when big companies keep charging you, Truebill is your secret weapon to save you money on subscriptions that you don't need. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill, because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. Truebill has over 2 million users and helps save them over $100 million. So don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Go right now to Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. It could save you thousands. Truebill.com slash locked on NBA. Thank you for making locked on NBA your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. So please do subscribe. Let's go to another team having a miserable season. Boston <laughs> Celtics, who lost to the Clippers 91 to 82 at home. The Celtics were down 10 early in the third quarter, but managed to come back and take a one point lead with nine and a half minutes left in the game but they couldn't hold on. Eric Bledsoe scores 10 of his 17 points in the fourth, and the Clippers got 23 points from Marcus Morris as they pulled away on a night that they were without Paul George and obviously still without Kawhi. Meanwhile, the Celtics had a, uh, an awful shooting night, going four for 42 from three-point range. That's 9.5%. That's just ridiculous. Uh, Jalen Brown playing without Jason Tatum, who is currently in health and safety protocols, also without Marcus Smart, who's nursing a hand injury. He scores 30 points. Which on its face, hey, great. That's what you need. But he was inefficient. He needed 36 shots to score those 30 points. He went one for 13 from beyond the arc. Not only that, Jalen Brown had a grand total of, get this, Big Dave, zero assists. Not one single assist. Not what the Celtics need from Jalen Brown when they are this shorthanded. They need him to lead. Instead, they've lost their last three games. They've dropped uh, to 16 and 19 on the season. 
Let's talk a little bit about Jalen Brown. Let's talk a little bit about the Boston Celtics. What do you make of this loss? Oh, it's it's a bad loss. Um, they started off solid in the first half. They really did. They were they were solid. You know, Brown was actually Brown had a great uh back to back possession of just back to back steals and breakaways and you know getting uh some easy points that way. But t- thirty six shots and no assist is insane. Now I understand because the shooting was terrible. And honestly, Wes, it was from what I read, it was the second worst shooting performance in NBA history. All right. History, not not Boston history, NBA history, the second worst. That's not good. But 30, that is still not an excuse to not have any assist. As you pointed out, he has to be the leader. He had to be the one out there, the guy to get everybody involved and to score the points. So, yeah, it was all on him. The burden was on him. So he knew the burden was on him to shoot the ball, but he didn't know the burden was on him to get everybody else involved. There's a disconnect there. I don't know if it's a coaching staff didn't inform him of these things or what was going on, (laughs) or he was just like, no, I'm chucking it up there. But you can't have 40, almost 40 shots and not feed anybody. That is crazy. Like, you have to be better than that. And that is a recipe for losing, which is what they just did. Look, I can already hear the Celtics fans talking to us. Hey, he had eight potential assists. There was that ESPN stats and information. (laughs) It's it's shots that, or or passes that go up as shots, and it just turns out that, you know, you need your teammate to make the shot to, to get registered for the assist. And he's had eight potential assists. I'll tell you what. I don't care about your potential assists. That is a useless. That's like what is this? The new screen assist stat, but like okay. less useful. I don't. <laughs> I don't need the potential assist stats. I need the actual assists. That's what helps the team win. Uh, I. You don't want to pin it all on Jalen Brown, but hey, you just made eight passes that could have been assists. Like, right. I don't know, man. You took thirty six shots. That's still not a great ratio. And it's not as if Jalen Brown is Chris Paul out here and just all of his teammates were missing shots, right? Like, this is a guy who's not really a a passer. He's not asked to do a lot of passing, but I think the Celtics have been sort of nudging him more in that direction of him trying to be a playmaker. Look, they've ever since they they got rid of Kyrie and they sort of veered away from Kemba Walker, they're basically banking on Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown becoming more of playmakers, right? A little bit more of like Paul George, what he's able to do for the Clippers – and actually some run some pick and roll and do some stuff for you on offense. And that's just not really what Jalen Brown's game is. The, his career high in assists is three and a half. And that was in his one all-star season two years ago. Wow. He's usually around one and a half, two a game. He's just not a playmaker. And this game was just, look, it's a lot to put this on Jalen Brown, right? He obviously tried to do what he could by taking 36 shots. He thought that that was the best thing that he could do for his team. He's not a playmaker, but this is just a reminder that he is not a playmaker and that perhaps that is that is what the, that's maybe more than anything capping his ceiling as maybe this this you know sort of all pro two way guy that the Celtics thought that they had in him. No, you're absolutely right. Um that's not a guy who is a 1A if 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 that's the way it's going to be played. Like three three assists is your career high. That's crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like three and a half is is insane. He's too yeah. good. You know what I'm saying? I think that's what I, I think that's what I'm kind of getting at here. He's he's just too good to not have at least a couple of of assists like that, to not see the floor a little bit better, to not get some of his guys involved. I mean, he's got guys, you know, to pass to. I mean, he's got Time Lord. You know, he's open for alley oop all the time. Al Horford, even though he had a bad night shooting, I'm with three or fourteen, he had a terrible night shooting, but still, you got Al Horford out there to, to get the ball to. I mean, you got guys you can get the ball to to get you a layup at least. And to not even get that going, to just say, nope, I'm the one, it's on me, I'm chucking it up. You don't have a problem shooting, <laughs> but you have an issue passing. This It's something there, man. Like I, You're right. I don't, I don't want to put this all on him. You're right. It's tough to, but when you're the guy taking 36 shots, you're the person that I'm going to look at. You're the person that we immediately are going straight to. And you're the 1A in this instance. So as much as you can get all the... um fanfare and love when you win and do something you know wonderful you got to take it when it's two man like the worst second worst performance in nba history and you were the guy leading that team that's tough man it's tough let's get to some other scores from around the league the mavericks at the kings uh in sacramento where chikezi metu hits a buzzer beating three to beat the mavericks 95 to 94 during a back and forth fourth quarter the kings were down two with 30 seconds left 
and put the ball in Harrison Barnes's hands. He makes this beautiful spin move to get right to the basket, misses the wide open layup, but Sacramento gets another chance after forcing a 24 second violation on the Mavericks, who are still without Luka Doncic, by the way, still in protocols. Alvin Gentry draws up the play. De'Aaron Fox drives into the lane, kicks out to an open Metu in the corner, who makes his third three pointer of the game. This from Metu, who is three for 21 from three point range in his previous six games. But none mm. bigger than this one. What did you think of that final play, Dave? Man, I called him Met Who because I didn't know who that dude was. <laughs> honestly, I was like, "Who is this cat?" And and you know what's wild is I love the Sacramento Kings. They're one of my favorite teams to watch on League Pass. Honestly, I'm a huge De'Aaron Fox fan. He's like one of my guys. I love De'Aaron Fox. I love Tyrese Halliburton, the new guy, uh, Davian Mitchell that they have. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a stud, especially defensively. Like and him getting a three point shot, he was solid offensively as well in this game. But him getting that as well. He's, he's going to be a problem uh, in the future, man. I am happy that it seems like it's some chemistry forming on this team because it didn't seem like that when, you know, Luke Walton was going along. And maybe Alvin Gentry kicked him in the pants a little bit when he said, you know, I've, in my 34 years of coaching, I've never been more disappointed in a team. He said that a few games ago. Well, it seems to have ignited them, you know, somewhat. And they came out and they played tough. I mean, I give credit to the Mavericks. As you said, they played without Luka. Uh, but – Brunson in that third quarter went crazy. Like Brunson was on a roll and he's the reason they even got back into that game because he went on a serious roll in that third quarter. He did a great job. Porzingis finally started scoring the bucket. He didn't really score until, you know, the second half. He didn't, he only scored what, two points in the first half, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, shout out to them because they played tough, you know, even without Luca, Dallas still played a little bit tough, but man, Sacramento, they're always that team that's, right there you know what i'm saying on the cusp maybe we could get into a play-in game something and then you know the ring breaks and then they fall to the ground and they don't do it like that man but kudos to them for pulling this one out because man that was a great play that they drew up at the end for him to get to the bucket kicked it i mean he was wide open he had time to make pancakes and everything man it was a great (laughs) job Two games in a row they've won. Only a half game out of the playing tournament. So, I don't mm. know. Maybe something brewing in Sacramento. Maybe you'll be able to watch your team play a little bit more. Um, let's go to New York where Alec Burks scored 34 points to lead a huge night from the Knicks bench in a 94-85 to win over the Pistons. With the starters not playing well, which has sort of been a trend for the Knicks this season, Tom Thibodeau rode his second unit in the fourth quarter when Burks scored 19 of his points and New York outscored Detroit 30-14. to to get the win. And all the Knicks bench outscores the Pistons bench 65 to 7. I'll say that one more time. The Knicks bench outscored the Pistons bench 65 to 7. A needed boost with Julius Randle being limited to five points. In Indiana, the Hornets beat the Pacers 116 to 108 thanks to a season high 35 points from Terry Rozier and a neat triple double from, or a near triple double, excuse me. From LaMelo Ball, 21 points, 12 rebounds, and 9 assists. The Hornets pulled away in the final minute thanks to a LaMelo Ball assist to Mason Plumley at the basket and then Rozier's free throws. Story of the game, though, Dave. It was a Star Wars night in Indianapolis, and Miles Turner shows up in a full Darth Vader costume complete with two stormtroopers. You can't lose a game when you show up dressed like Darth Vader. You'll never lose a game showing up dressed like Darth Vader. That's amazing. I, I got to see this now. After this is over, I'm going to look this up. I got to check this out, man. That's awesome. Let's go to the Thunder at the Suns. Devin Booker scores 38 points, surpassing 10,000 points for his career. The Suns beat the Thunder 115-97 to to end a two-game losing streak and tie the Warriors for the best record in the league at 27-7. and Mm. Devin Booker made 12 of his 24 shots from the floor, going 6 of 12 from three-point range, helped the Suns pull away in the fourth when they outscored the Thunder 30-16. to The Bulls won their fifth straight game with a 131-117 to win over the Hawks. Zach Levine scores 25 points against the Hawks, uh, who were missing 15 players due to health and safety Mm. protocols and injuries. They did have Trey Young. He scores 26 points in the game. However, Atlanta really never had a chance after Chicago's 18 to 1 run that gave the Bulls a 21 point lead at halftime. Chicago also got contributions from Nikola Vucevic, 16 points, 20 rebounds. DeMar DeRozan, 20 points. Big Dave, what do you make of the Bulls' win streak at five games now? It's amazing to watch. I'm I'm not a guy who usually takes it game by game, 
you know, I grew up watching Jordan's Bulls. I'm I'm used to saying, let's just get to the playoffs and then we'll watch it. <laughs> but knowing that we haven't dealt with this in about four or five years, I haven't seen a good basketball team. I'm taking this game by game and enjoying every single second of it because I haven't so long. It's been amazing to watch. Honestly, it's been so much fun to watch. Five games in a row. I can't even tell you the last time they won five games in a row. Like, uh, uh, Miritich was here. Chris Dunn was still here. They went on like a seven-game winning streak. It's been a long time, okay? So this is fun to watch. They look real serious, like, and real for real. And that's the thing that I like the most. They're not just playing around, man. This is a serious, serious team. They're a game out of first place. Yeah, You know, bro. they've always, they've been in that top three, top four in the East all season long. They're a game out of mm-hmm. first place behind, uh, of course, the, the Brooklyn with, Nets. With two wins on against the Nets. Two wins against the Nets. Um, let's go to our final game here. The, led by the Rudys, the Utah Jazz beat the Blazers 120 to 105. Rudy Gobert, 22 points and 14 rebounds. Rudy Gay, 21 points off the bench. They take care of the Blazers. Damian Lillard, Norman Powell, they each finished with 32 points, but that wasn't enough. They didn't get enough help. Utah has now won, like Chicago, five straight games. They're 25 and nine now, two games behind the Warriors and the Suns in the Western Conference standings. And finally, Tuesday saw the NBA's 10th postponed game of the season as the Miami Heat's game in San Antonio was called off due to the Heat not being able to meet the league-required eight players. Miami is missing 12 players due to protocols and injuries. They are expected to be able to play Friday night in Houston when Kyle Lowry is expected to clear protocols and Jimmy Butler is is expected to return from a right ankle sprain. All right, coming up. Kyrie Irving practiced for the first time with the Nets this season, but don't expect him to be making a difference anytime soon. But let's talk about our friends at Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered this holiday season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football continues its march through the college bowl season and pro football playoffs. BetOnline remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code LOCKEDON. From basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage on all these amazing offers available for this season. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports, so don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers available. It's BetOnline, where the game starts. Kyrie Irving returned to a Brooklyn Nets practice for the first time since the preseason and said he understood and respected the team's decision to have him stay away because of New York City's vaccine mandate but after a COVID outbreak led to 10 Nets players and health and safety protocols the Nets had three games postponed last week they opted to bring Kyrie back for road games because well they were desperate Irving cleared protocols on Tuesday and practiced on Wednesday but it it's going to be a while before Kyrie Irving makes his season debut because the Nets don't play their next road game because he can't play at home games Mm-hmm. until January 5th in Indiana. After that, the Nets aren't on the road until January 12th in Chicago. Big Dave, how big of an impact can Kyrie have on a part-time basis only playing road games? I think he'll have a a, a good impact, honestly, um, because it's Kyrie Irving, because he's one of the best players in this league. Um, we know his resume. We've seen what he's done, and we know who he is. So, even though it's half of the games that he's going to play, you're still going to need him on the road, you know, when they play against whoever they go against. You're going to need Kyrie Irving. You know what I mean? You're not going to turn that down. This dude is a bucket. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's an right. actual straight-up problem. I'm not looking forward to facing him on January 12th. I promise you that. My thing that I've been thinking about, though, Wes, is the detriment that it might cause in the playoffs when they're playing like this. Does home court advantage really become an advantage? for them Mm. say if it goes down to game seven he can't play if you're playing game seven they're going to be at home he can't play in that game that that could really really hurt that team going forward you know what i'm saying that could really hurt them going forward so so does them winning and having a number one he come back to bite them because can't be out there remember what happened with them last year and that's the only reason i bring this up is because last year without Kyrie irving seven games they could not win against uh, the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, Harden was out there, although he was a little bit injured. He still was out there, and Kevin Durant is Kevin Durant. But no Kyrie Irving was a big, big issue and a big reason why they didn't pull off that victory uh, in that series. So that could still be an issue this year with him not being out there for those home games in the playoffs. 
Yeah, first of all, I, I see what you're doing. We just got done talking about how your Bulls are only a game out of first place. So I, I understand you're trying to create this narrative, trying to get angling for the Nets, maybe to tank a few games, let your Bulls get first place. It's all lost on me. But uh, it it's actually worth considering. Like if Look, first of all, no idea if New York City is going to drop this vaccine mandate uh, or, or what's going to happen. But no signs that they are going to do that anytime soon with the Omicron variant out there. Like, I don't know. Probably not. Ha- I, you wouldn't count on it if you're the Nets, certainly. And so maybe if it's like the last couple weeks of the season and you're there in first place and you're thinking, you know what? If we are in a game seven situation, is is how much do you value home court versus Kyrie's availability? I guess we'll have to see how Kyrie plays. What kind of shape is he in after being away from the team so long? Steve Nash said today that he's surprised and how well uh, of shape Kyrie Irving was in. But of course he's going to say that. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see. But the big thing to me is, you know, Patty Mills has been great starting in place of of Kyrie Irving at point guard. But you need to get some rest for Kevin Durant because you've been asking so much of him. He's 33 years old. He's playing 37 minutes a night. He hasn't played 37 minutes per game since he was 25. He won the MVP that year. He might win the MVP this year. But I don't know that all, all that's very important to Kevin Durant. I think he would rather be fresh for the postseason. So if you're able to just get another body out there, maybe you're able to save Kevin Durant on road games and play Kyrie Irving in those situations. I don't know. But um, you, something's got to give for Brooklyn, and this is why yeah. I think they're bringing Kyrie back in the first place. Um, all right, a little bit less fun news. Ricky Rubio out for the remainder of the season with a torn ACL. Now, Unfortunately, this is the ACL that he tore uh, back a, a, a few years ago. And oh, so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big concern for Rubio. It's a bigger, it, it's also a very big concern for the Cleveland Cavaliers who have been on a roll right now as we're recording this. They're, they're, they're fifth place in the Eastern Conference, um, just three or just four games out of first place. Uh, they're among the surprises in the NBA. Rubio has had, not everything to do with that, but a lot to do with it. The Cavaliers mm-hmm. have had a plus 16.1 net efficiency rating with Rubio and, uh, on the floor. Uh, with, I'm sorry, when Rubio has shared the floor with Darius Garland, and Garland is also out. So this is a big blow to that backcourt. Um, Rubio's averaged 13.1 points per game this season, tied mm-hmm. for the most uh, in a season for his career. How big of a loss is this for the Cavs? It's huge. It's it's a huge loss. Um, not only for the reasons that you stated so accurately, you know, as far as the numbers are concerned, but just his presence as a veteran and what he did for the younger guys also is also huge. Uh, what he did for those players out like Mobley, you know what I'm saying? Like even uh Lowry Markinen, you know, continuing to have those guys involved, you know what I'm saying, in the play. Jared Allen, you saw how it effect he had on him as well. But it's going to be huge not having him out there because having a, a veteran like that, especially at a point guard who can be a coach on the floor and tell everybody where they need to be, where it's going to go when guys develop a relationship on the floor, you know, basketball wise, knowing where they need to be, knowing where he's going to get them the ball. Losing that is going to hurt because he was having, matter of fact, when he got hurt, he was having an incredible game. You know what I'm saying? He was Mm -hmm. at, what do you have? Like 32, 10 and nine or something. He was having like a near triple double kind of game. He was really balling out of control. So it's huge. It's a huge loss for them because, you see what it was doing and what it did for this team that nobody really expected to even be in this situation right here. And now you look in their backcourt and you have Garland and Sexton is already out for the year. So you're looking at Garland and you're like, well, who else you got? And I do not want to subject them to time because I've had to sit there and watch that all these years here in Chicago. I know how that's going to end for y'all. So I don't know, man. It's, it's a it's a big blow because they really needed his veteran presence out there along with all the points and assists that he was uh, doling out and the points that he was uh, putting into the bucket. Yeah. It's a, it's a big blow. His partnership with Kevin Love was really big. We've kind of seen a reinvigorated Kevin Love this season. Of course, they played together in Minnesota. That was one of the motivations in bringing him back. Uh, right. It was Brian Windhorst for ESPN wrote a great story this week on – just how they approach the Cavaliers front office, how they approach this off season. And they want, they, they approach Kevin Love. They said, Hey, we want you to be our ACE big off the bench. We don't want you to be starting and to sweeten the pot for him a little bit. They, they went out and got Ricky Rubio to kind of create that pick and pop partnership, that two man game without Rubio there. Look, I'm not going to say that, that, that neutralizes what it is that Kevin Love can do, but it certainly doesn't help. 
right? And so there's a domino effect to your point, the leadership, all this stuff that he brings, there's a domino effect across the roster. Um, I don't know if you're the Cavaliers, what you do now. You're still in the hunt in the playoffs. I don't, you're not a realistic title contender, so you don't want to jump the gun and make some sort of silly win now move, like trade a, a future piece to try to go get a veteran point guard now. But I think it's a position that you could try to address because without Garland, or I'm sorry, without Sexton already for the rest of the season, without Rubio, with Garland, you know, dealing with his thing right now, I just think you need somebody there for some depth. But I, I don't really know what kind of move is out there for them. Uh, I guess we'll see. Um, we'll see. All right. That's a wrap for us today. Remember to subscribe to new episodes of Locked On NBA wherever you listen to podcasts for 30 minutes of the NBA's top stories every day. You can find me over at Locked On Eden, Big Dave over at Locked On Bulls. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Now make your second listen, Locked On Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all of your gambling needs. It's free. It's available on all platforms. Happy New Year, Dave. Happy New Year to you too, Wes. <laughs>